So hello and welcome to our webinar, Understanding the Menstrual Cycle with Dr. Karen Morton. My name is Lavinia Winch and I'm ambassador for the YES Organic Intimacy Products. At YES, we're passionate about women's health and have chosen to bring educational webinar, webinars and Instagram lives around the topic to benefit our community. I think this has been an especially relevant during the pandemic, as we know that many women have been more reserved about seeking help from their GP. We've called this series of live videos, Talking Vaginas, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Karen Morton to present today on Understanding the Menstrual Cycle. At DS, we believe that understanding this stage of our reproductive lives can help us to navigate what sometimes can be a challenging time. And it was at a menopause event that I listened to Karen explaining the role that hormones play in our cycle. And I realized how important this is. And so we asked her if she'd be kind enough to be our guest and she very gratefully accepted. So I'm gonna give you some background to, to Karen. So Dr. Karen Morton is a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist in Guildford. Her special interests are paediatric and adolescent gynaecology and menopause, being on the menopause specialist register of the British Menopause Society. Her obstetric experience is in the care of medical problems in pregnancy, such as diabetes and thyroid disease, and she loves the excitement and challenge of the labour ward. But Karen's latest venture has been to develop a health tech solution for everyone, but for women in particular. This is a helpline, and it's called Dr Morton's. After years of dealing with a multitude of gynecological issues over the phone, she concluded that medicine had been slow to embrace communication technology. And women need, for gynecological reasons, such as contraception, period problems, fertility and pregnancy, and then menopausal matters, to seek medical health, medical advice more than men. And her mission is to deal with the gender health inequality and the impact it undoubtedly has on career progression. So I'm going to hand over to Karen and she's going to give us a, a, an initial presentation and then we'll chat around some of the topics that come up in her in her slides. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Not at all. So I hope that you can see those slides. Can you see that screen? Can you just confirm that for me, Lavinia? Yeah, Good. That's okay. Fine. Uh, well, Thank you so much, Lavinia. It's, it's, it's uh, very nice to be here. And thank you for asking me. Um, I, I, I feel completely passionate about women's health from sort of cradle to grave. Um, and so um, talking about periods and how uh, the uterus and every, the ovaries work will be um, second nature and a great privilege and, and good fun, I hope. OK, so the embryology. Um, I think it's important we know what a uterus is, and I think it's important to have some concept of embryology. Uh, in other words, how we became a girl as opposed to uh, being a boy. Uh, the, the, the default position uh, is uh, to be a boy. Um, and we become a girl because there isn't a Y chromosome. It's the Y chromosome that leads to the development of testes. And from the testes come not only uh, male hormone testosterone, but also uh, a substance called the malarian inhibitor. Um, and uh, when we are a flat plate inside our mother's uterus, in, inside our mother's uterus, so when we are literally a flat plate, uh, there's a lot of folding that happens. Um, we fold in the middle. I, don't, I hope you can see my arms. I hope you can, Lavinia, can you? We fold in the middle. We fold in the middle. We fold in the middle. Now, my hands at this moment are two uteri, and my wrists are the cervix, two cervices, and my arms are the vaginas. And we start with two of everything, and we blend in the middle. And so most of us are born with one uterus, one cervix, and one vagina but some of us will be born with two of each, two uteri, two vaginas, two cervices. That has a fancy name called uterus didelphus. But the bottom line is that we start with these tubes on either side and everything folds in the middle. And the embryology of the uterus, vagina, tubes is very closely linked with the embryology of the kidneys. And so if I'm looking after a, a, a woman who has got an abnormality of the way the uterus developed, I have to look carefully to check that her kidneys are in the right place and that she's, and that she's got two of them. 
and sometimes she won't have. Now it's important to realize that the embryology of the ovaries is completely separate to the embryology of the uterus, tubes and vagina. So this is a picture which is going to crop up in my talk a few times. This is me with a telescope just under the tummy button of a lady looking down into the pelvis. And this is the top of the uterus. These are the two fallopian tubes. And here are lovely white shiny ovaries, which are just connected by a little stalk from the corner of the uterus. This is a lovely healthy pelvis. Now, I'm afraid my sex education started with the finding of a packet of Dr. White's in my dressing table drawer. I'm glad that things have changed since then. And I'm glad that sanitary products have changed since then. Uh, my mother didn't actually talk to me about it at all. And there wasn't much spoken at school either. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's, it should be a girl's education forever really. Um, when I'm, when I, I've been doing a clinic this morning and when um, there will often be uh, children come with their mothers and I encourage their mothers to be, and there's a balance between privacy and just making everything seem normal. Um, encouraging girls to know that their mothers have smear tests and have things done is a way of uh, starting their education in an appropriate way. Of course, a period happens because we did not conceive that month. And I'm going to talk to you in detail about what hormonal changes happen within the menstrual cycle that lead to the shedding of this blood and, the, and, the, and this blood coming out through the cervix and out through the vagina. It's one of my missions, actually. Lavinia, you might be interested to hear this mission. This is a menstrual cup, of course, over here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much in favor of saving the planet as well. And um, I do think that girls, when they go to secondary school, should all be given a menstrual cup and that there should be some actual lessons in, in school about how to use them. They're incredibly easy to use. Uh, and of course, um, completely um, impactless on the planet. Okay, so puberty, it happens in a sequence and it's a very specific sequence. It would be incredibly rare to start to have periods before breasts and pubic and other sec uh, sexual hair. So hair under the arms and um, development of, of hair on the legs and just generally sexual hair. Uh, before those things reach, reach a certain stage of development, periods don't come. So the right name for the onset of periods is menarche, uh, and that will usually come about two years after breast and pubic hair development have started. So if I see a girl um, who is worried that her periods haven't started and she's 15, then it's pertinent to ask when did the breast start to develop? When did pubic hair start to develop? It will usually all happen in a sequence. Now, I make no apology for this drawing. It's a hand, hand done drawing, which is probably photo, photo specifically out of any set of notes that I uh, have, ha where I've been having a consultation about all sorts of different things. It might be, why haven't my periods started? Why are they so frequent? Why are they heavy? Um, why haven't I conceived? Any aspect of gynecology, this drawing and what I'm going to explain is fundamental to understanding how your ovaries work and what periods are. So from when you were the tiniest, weeniest little embryo, no bigger than half a centimeter from head to toe, you put into your ovaries 
which at that time, of course, are just a speck, all the eggs you're ever going to have. You don't make any new eggs during your lifetime. It's not like the testes, which are factories that churn out new sperm from, from starting point, from nothing, millions of them every day from puberty to death. But women are born with a finite number of eggs. They are immature eggs. They sit in the ovaries. I've only drawn one ovary, but obviously there are two usually. And of those millions of eggs, the majority of them will just shrivel up and just dissolve away and come to nothing. But from about seven onwards, the ovaries first of all start to make a little bit of hormones, a little bit of estrogen. And then they start to, at about 10 usually, they start to choose an egg, one of the eggs that is going to be the one that is brought to maturity. And for the first couple of years or so, they just play at it and the, the eggs don't fully come to maturity. But from the moment a girl gets her first period, it means that she made a mature egg. So an egg is chosen and it comes to maturity in a follicle and the follicle grows and grows and grows and grows and the egg is inside that follicle on a little mound of cells. And a mature follicle measures about three centimeters diameter. Now, if a girl were to have an ultrasound scan at that time, she would be told that there is a cyst measuring three centimeters diameter on whichever ovary it is. Now, this is a really important point. Ovaries are cystic structures. That is how they work. The word cyst is purely a description. You could have a little thing on your eyelid which had some fluid in it and it would be a cyst on your eyelid. So this causes a huge amount of confusion and upset when girls women go to have a scan for one reason or another and they're told that there is a cyst found on the ovary. So it's normal at different phases of the cycle to find a fluid filled cystic structure on the ovary. So when the, the egg is mature, a trigger comes from the pituitary gland. Now this is meant to be a brain and the pituitary gland sits about four centimeters behind the bridge of your nose. It just dangles there like a little pea. And it is the master gland. It is the master gland for all the major hormone systems in your body. So the thyroid gland is controlled by the pituitary, your adrenal glands sitting just above your kidneys, the testes in in men and the ovaries in women. And the pituitary makes two driving hormones, the follicular stimulating hormone, FSH, and the luteinizing hormone. So the follicular stimulating hormone is busy driving this follicle. A, a surge of these hormones triggers that follicle to burst and the egg falls out. And the watery fluid that was in there just disappears, just disperses around the body. Now, the next thing that happens on the ovary is that same spot where the egg started swells again very quickly in the second half of the cycle. And this structure here now about still another fluid filled structure. It's a, it's a cystic structure, but it's a slightly thicker fluid, not watery. And this measures about half the diameter of the follicle, about one and a half centimeters. And it is called 
the corpus luteum. And the job of the corpus luteum is to make the hormone of the second half of the cycle, which is progesterone. Now the job of progesterone is to make the lining of the uterus, the correct name for that is the endometrium, which has grown from this layer here under the influence of estrogen that is coming from all the other cells in the ovary through the bloodstream. Estrogen is telling the lining of the womb to grow, 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 grow. And then progesterone tells it to stop growing and become all nice and juicy. Because of course, in the scheme of evolution, there will have been millions of sperm going swim, 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 swim. And fertilization would occur here at the end of the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube has moved over here to pick up the egg, to waft it in with its little fimbri, its little fingers, little tentacles, wafting it in. So fertilization has occurred here. And then of course the fertilized, now multiplying uh, ball of cells is moving along down the fallopian tube on it goes into the uterus and it arrives here just at the moment it needs to grip on to be nourished. Of course, if it grips on too soon, that's the nature of an ectopic pregnancy, a tubal pregnancy inside the, inside the fallopian tube. So this nice juicy endometrium nourishes the pregnancy until the pregnancy then develops further and becomes a fully fledged placenta and pregnancy. Now, because human beings control their fertility, of course there aren't sperm going swim, 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 swim. And so fertilization does not occur. And the corpus luteum realizes probably through some chemical message that there is no pregnancy. And so it is no longer needed. And so within a matter of a couple of hours, it shrivels up very, very quickly. The progesterone level falls and the lining of the womb, no longer supported by the pregnancy, falls away and we get a period. So the uterus does nothing of its own accord. The uterus is told what to do by the ovaries. And the ovaries are told what to do by the pituitary gland. The ovaries make three types of estrogen, of which estradiol is the most pr uh, predominant one, well over 80%. Estriol and estradiol uh, are other types of estrogen. It only makes progesterone when we've made an egg. It doesn't make it at any other time. It makes some male hormone and the menopause comes when there are no eggs left. I'm going to just dwell on the uterus just for a moment, not on the hormonal side, but on the period. What is the period? Well, the lining of the womb is a sort of flimsy nothingness, really. People imagine that that's the period. The, the lining of the womb, but it isn't. The period is really blood that is coming from your whole body through all the little blood vessels that have become revealed as the lining of the womb shed away. So there are blood vessels, I wish I could add to this drawing now, coming through the wall of the uterus from the main uterine artery that runs parallel to the uterus. There are Thousands and thousands of these little blood vessels now roar just as if you'd cut yourself. And the blood is blood coming from your whole body out through these raw blood vessels. Now, if you were to cut yourself, you'd press on it, wouldn't you? But actually, even if you didn't press on your hand, unless you'd cut a major artery, you wouldn't bleed to death because we'd have died out as a, as a species long ago. So we have mechanisms for stopping bleeding from damaged blood vessels. And those mechanisms are threefold. 
Firstly, the little vessels, the lumen of the vessel, they have a muscular coat and when they're damaged, they constrict, they spasm. So we limit bleeding by that. And secondly, we make little plugs inside the blood vessels, little tiny microscopic clots plugging the blood vessels. And then of course, healing occurs because the hormones are telling the lining of the womb to grow again. And that stops the bleeding completely. And then the whole thing starts again. So the amount of blood that we see is really a feature of the way in which these blood vessels that are bleeding stop bleeding. Not really much to do with the lining of the womb itself. Except later on in my short talk, I will emphasize how the surface area of the lining of the womb can be important for heaviness of periods. Because if the surface area is bigger, then of course there'll be more raw blood vessels and the periods will be heavier. When I sent these slides to Lavinia, I think she thought I'm not a great fan of apps uh, to, to monitor uh, cycles. It's not that I'm not a great fan of it, it's just, it's just a sort of plethora of noise in a way, in my, in my view. Um, of course, it's, it's good and it's interesting and we should have control. We should, be, we should understand how we work and, and know when our fertile period is and all of this. Um, but I think uh, understanding the sort of thing we've been talking about so far is actually far more, more important and actually far more interesting, really. Um, but nonetheless, um, we, it, it, it's useful to have information about ourselves. And if we store that electronically, well, so we'll all to the good. Um, but they don't, it doesn't actually produce a solution, but information is important, so that's okay. Now, I'm going to come to a, a really recurring theme in my talk. I like to explain how everything in nature uh, has a peak around a bell-shaped curve. The right name for that is a Gaussian distribution. I call it the Gaussian distribution of life. What that means is there's an average for everything and then there are extremes for everything. So if you took girl's height, for example, most girls average height will be about five foot four. I'm so sorry, I'm not very centimeter orientated. But there will be girls who will be four foot 10 and it's not abnormal, it's just very unusual. And there will be girls who will be six foot three and it's not abnormal, it's just very unusual. Okay, so my periods haven't started yet. Okay, so average age of the onset of periods is 13. That means that 50% of women's periods will have started at, at 13. But by definition, 50% of women's periods will not have started. And of course, at the extremes become things where you have to think, is this just a range of the norm or could there be something not right? Could there be something not right? So believe it or not, uh, there is such a condition as what, what is called precocious puberty. So the normal range to just down to about two or 3% will be the age of nine. But before the age of nine, I mean, goodness knows it must be tough enough to start your periods at nine and have breasts and pubic hair. But before that, it is definitely uh, not usual, not normal. There will be an underlying pathological reason. And there are lots of interesting and uh, um, important causes of precocious puberty. At the other extreme, if it's over 15, certainly 16, it would be very unusual indeed not to have started your periods. There will be some, you, people get called late developers and you go back to, you know, have the breast developed, have has pubic hair developed, but that might be a time uh, for being referred for investigation, just in case there is some underlying reason for periods not having started. But up until 
certainly 15, probably even 15 and a half, it's well within the normal range. So another common reason for seeking advice is my period started, but they've stopped. Okay, well, we are just mammals. We are mammals in the scheme of evolution. And there are many examples in nature where periods stop because that mammal, that female human mammal, no doubt it happens in non-human mammals too, is not in the right environmental, emotional, nutritional, general health situation to either be pregnant, carrying a baby, or nurturing newborn babies with breast milk. So very good examples of this are Maasai women, while they are migrating across the Serengeti and walking over 100 miles a day, that very wisely nature stops her periods so that she does not conceive until she gets to where they're building their new village and then her periods return. Other good examples, probably the best in our Western society would be the consequences of anorexia, of profound weight loss, either through uh, um, uh, an eating disorder mental uh, with uh, anorexia nervosa um, or profound weight loss due to illness, other illness, or profound weight, um, um, a weight, um, a disproportionate weight situation where there isn't any significant fat, even though they're, the actual body weight may be normal, many prima ballerinas do not have periods because they haven't got the right ratio between fat and muscle. Marathon runners. Very, you know, very supreme athletes will often stop their periods. Emotional upset. When I have a lady who's lost a baby uh, and she comes to see me uh, six, eight, ten weeks later um, for uh, to discuss the tragedy of the events, I will often ask her, well, I will always ask her, have, has she had a period yet? And if she has, I say, well, that's fantastic, because that tells me that even though you are still grieving and desperately sad, actually nature has decided that you are recovering and that you are in the right physical and even emotional situation, that you can now start to look forward and think about trying for another baby, because nature has made your ovaries start to work again. Okay, so uh, pregnancy, well, of course, um, there will always be uh, unexpected pregnancy as to why your periods have stopped. And you would hardly believe it possible that concealed pregnancies still come into the A&E department in my hospital, but they do about every, every three or four years. Uh, usually a very young woman will arrive with abdominal pain and all of a sudden there'll be a baby. <sighs> Quite amazing. Um, lazy ovaries. Okay, so when I'm asking a girl about her menstrual cycle, uh, I want to know how the cycle is the number of days from the first day of one period to the first day of the next. A lot of people, when you ask them, uh, how long is it between their periods? They, they think it's just the number of days not bleeding, but that's, you need to include the bleeding bit for the length of the menstrual cycle. And a normal menstrual cycle, probably relating to that Gaussian distribution again, maybe I mention it later, uh, an average length of menstrual cycle will be 28 days. But some women will have a 21 day cycle all their lives. And some people will have a 35 day cycle all their lives and all shades of gray in between those things. If the cycle is longer than 35 days, then she is probably not ovulating predictably and regularly. And if she wants a baby, then I might give her some help 
um, by giving her some tablets to try to drive her ovaries a little harder. We can talk about that if you would like to later. But having lazy ovaries does not equate necessarily to the polycystic ovary syndrome, which we will talk about later. Uh, it's perfectly possible just to have lazy ovaries in the context of just the ovaries, nothing else, just the ovaries are a bit quiet and lazy. And then there are lots and lots of rare causes of uh, why periods might stop. Um, I'm happy to talk about all of them at some point if you would like me to. Okay, so back to the Gaussian distribution. My periods are heavy, they're long, they're painful. Okay, so with each one of those things, most women will have a moderate loss. An average blood loss for a menstrual period is about 80 mils of blood. Some people will have a tiny little spotting as their period, and that's normal for them. Other people will have a deluge. And of course, if something is spoiling their quality of life or making them anemic or unwell in some way, then it warrants investigation. One may find nothing, but it warrants investigation. Most periods will last for about five days with a little tiny lead in of a few dribs and drabs and a little tiny lead out. And the bleed itself, the proper red bleed will last four to five days. But some girls' periods will just be a two day wonder and some girls will go on for 10 days or even longer. That of course is very boring. And if it's boring and spoiling what you would like to be doing with your life, then you should do something about it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's abnormal. And then pain. Most people will take a Nurofen or something for their slightly crampy period on the first or second day. Some girls will take absolutely nothing and they don't even notice it's there. And a proportion of girls, their periods will be so painful that they can't function. And if a Feminax or a Nurofen or something does not mean that you can carry on with your life without any interruption, then you should seek help. Because in my view, the first time a girl does not go to school because of her painful period, or doesn't play sport because of it, or doesn't go to a party or goes home from work, her life is compromised. Her confidence is lessened. The way the, the world views her is diminished. And I think that that is a, a dreadful uh, outcome. Uh, and I believe that it's, it is at the root of the gender pay gap and the gender career progression gap. And that's really one of my huge passions. Now, I think the next one, a picture is a picture of an inside of a uterus. It is, okay. Now, Lavinia didn't think that people would like to see the inside of the uterus, or the, but I know that that's not true. I know people do enjoy, they find the body fascinating once they get engaged with it. And this is me with a telescope looking inside a uterus. And you can see as well as I can that this cavity, which should be completely smooth, completely smooth is not. There's something dangling on a little stalk here. And there's another something up there. And there's another something there. And these are fibroids, which are inside the cavity of the uterus. And uh, they will be dramatically expanding the surface area of the endometrium. And this girl's periods will be extremely heavy. So if, if the, the uh, woman is in this part of the of the curve and her periods are compromising her in whatever way uh, 
we we could either we we've talked about heavy or painful or whatever she needs an ultrasound scan she needs an ultrasound scan of the of the pelvis and the best way to have an ultrasound scan of the pelvis is using a little probe about the size of a thumb placed just inside the vagina because the uterus and the ovaries sit way down in the pelvis they're behind the bones the, the pelvis is a big basin and you don't get a good view of the uterus or the ovaries uh, using a scanner with a probe on your tummy. When, the, when you're having it during pregnancy, of course, the, the uterus is up inside, up inside the tummy. And so you see the baby very well. But this should be done using a transvaginal scan. And this is very easily dealt with by putting a telescope into the uterus with an operating channel. So you can chip that away and make that uh, endometrial cavity, the inside of the womb, completely smooth and regular. Now, I wanted just to talk about fibroids in a little bit more detail. So a fibroid itself is an, is an innocent lump of fibrous tissue. They are very, very common. One in five women have fibroids uh, in the uterus. They are often multiple. There may be lots of little circles of fibroid, solid fibroid, but they only affect the periods if they uh, affect the inside of the womb. If, if I put that fibroid on the outer surface of the uterus, you would barely know it was there. That's only about three centimeters diameter, but because it's affecting the inside of the womb, it will be expanding the surface area of the inside of the womb. And that's very beautifully demonstrated on this fantastic MRI scan. This is some, somebody gone through into a magnet MRI scan. And here is the pubic bone. Here is the vagina. This is the bladder. Here's the uterus. And here's that fibroid pushing onto the inside of the womb. This is the spine and the tailbone. So various forms of imaging can be helpful um, uh, for getting a picture of the uterus. Now, clearly, if I put a telescope into this uterus and started to chip away at this fibroid, I would end up chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and finding that I'd gone out the other side. So this fibroid would not be the least bit suitable for chipping away from inside. It's suitable for another technique uh, whereby one can... Uh, thread a little piece of tubing through the uterine artery up to close to the to the fibroid and send into the fibroid billions of little particles to block off the blood supply to this fibroid so that it is killed and it dies and then it shrinks down to next to nothing that's called fibroid embolization and that would be the right treatment for this fibroid so now I want to talk about endometriosis. So within that end of the spectrum, end of the, the Gaussian distribution for pain, there will be women who have endometriosis. So endometriosis is where there is endometrium, womb lining, in other places other than in the womb. So that in the same way, that the lining of the womb responded to the hormones in the right place, the endometrium in the wrong place is also being stimulated to grow, stop growing, and then bleed. And blood in the tummy is a very, very irritant substance. Now this was the lovely healthy uterus that I showed you. And this is a lady, this, this, I want to show you this V here, this nice arc here. This is a very important ligament that holds the uterus up in place. And it's the commonest site for endometriosis. So here is a uterus and here is, you can see it's all, thickened and tethered it's not a nice smooth arc and it's got spots on it spots on it and these are spots of endometriosis and it causes it to be thickened and tethered and and incredibly tender and if I was to tell you 
that this structure sits at the top of the uterus, the top of the vagina, sorry, the top of the vagina. So during sex, this is the bit that takes the brunt of knocking about during sex and how painful that is during sex. So not only does endometriosis cause pain at period time, but because of the scarring and the tethering, it causes very severe pain during sex. And just on this uh, picture, you can see that this is marked as the rectum. And so these spots of endometriosis are all over the surface of the rectum as well. And so another classical symptom of endometriosis is pain when doing a poo during a period. So just this morning, I've seen a lovely girl who has terrible pain on the day before her period. And then the period just lasts two or three days. And then she has no pain in between. Sex is not painful. Doing a poo is not painful. She just has a painful period. So it is actually very unlikely that that woman, that young woman I saw this morning, has endometriosis. She's probably just got a painful period and she'd be better off not having a period at all. She's on the pill. So why on earth would she not just run the pill one packet after the next? And we can come to that. But of course, in this case, in this case, a scan will be normal because spots do not show up on a scan. If you have endometriosis on the ovaries, then blood can collect month after month after month after month, and you can get what are called chocolate cysts. That's because blood, when it alters, it goes brown like chocolate sauce. Uh, and in that case, a scan may show a chocolate cyst on an ovary. And that's worth dealing with surgically, but by and large spots should be dealt with medically. Now, I've also shown here how everything all stuck together. This is really big, bad endometriosis where there are chocolate cysts, but you really can't see them. They're hidden, they're buried away. It's caused all this inflammation. So this would be stage four endometriosis, really bad, everything stuck together. You can't even see where the fallopian tubes are because they're buried down within these adhesions, everything stuck together. Okay, I wanted to touch on the polycystic ovary syndrome, which is badly named. And in fact, there is a big push within gynecological and endocrine, that's people who look after hormones, circles to call it fame as opposed to the polycystic ovary syndrome. Because having lazy ovaries is a common thing, and it is merely one of the features of the female andrometabolic syndrome. Now, a syndrome, just for your information, in medicine, if somebody's told they've got a syndrome, it means they've got a collection of features that added together, somebody has described as them running together and therefore they're a collection of things. So it's a, it was a, it's a misnomer to say that it's the polycystic ovary syndrome. The syndrome is the collection of features that some women have of which having lazy ovaries, polycystic ovaries, that just means lots of little immature follicles happen to be one feature. So the polycystic ovary syndrome or the fame syndrome is really where there is a disturbance of a whole range of body chemistry things. And there is too much male hormone. We all have some male hormone. Uh, it's associated with uh, a weight disturbance because of insulin resistance. It's, it's a whole disturbance of uh, carbohydrate metabolism, male hormones and having lazy ovaries is one part of it. 
we should concentrate. And I think this will gain uh, a, a, um, recognition that we must stop calling it the polycystic ovary syndrome. Many women have lazy ovaries. It's of very little importance unless they want to have a baby right now. But having fame is a much bigger and more important um, whole chemistry situation where women definitely need help with fame. M many women don't need any help at all with, the poly with polycystic ovaries unless they want to have a baby right now. If they have lazy ovaries and they're off to university and becoming sexually active for the first time, then they may well do well just to go on the pill and have periods because otherwise they end up spending a fortune on pregnancy tests because they're worrying they're pregnant. But it, 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 it rarely in isolation has any particular bearing on fertility or other things. Whereas fame is a very important whole body chemistry illness where the weight aspect is a hugely important component and women need really clear help and guidance on how to address that. Then PMS, premenstrual syndrome. Uh, of course, progesterone, which you will remember, we only make when we've made an egg is therefore high, only present in the premenstrual phase of our cycle. And progesterone on the whole makes us feel not as well as we'd like to. On the whole, it makes us a bit bloated because the gut, the gut, if you cut a cross section through the gut, it has a muscle coat in the middle smooth muscle, which is responsible for the nice rhythmic peristalsis movement of food along our gut. And progesterone makes that muscle coat, that smooth muscle, completely different to the muscle in our arms over which we have voluntary control, very floppy. So that instead of nice rhythmic peristalsis, it's pockets of wind everywhere. And some girls will get actual bowel disturbance, be that a runny tummy or be that constipation, but they certainly will get floppy gut to the point where they feel as if their tummy is huge and indeed well, often their skirt size will change. It often makes our skin a bit spotty. It may make us retain a little bit of fluid. It may make our mood not so good. And in the same way as that Gaussian distribution of life prevails, there will be some women at an extreme where those symptoms affect a woman's quality of life. And there, there isn't good evidence as to what should be done about it. Understanding it's really important for some girls going on the pill so that you abolish ovulation, egg production, so that the hormones are the same all day, every day. There is no cycle. Some girls, even when they're taking the pill, they think they're getting PMS before their period. And so even though there's no change in their hormones at all because the pill is suppressing everything to do with ovarian function, but they're psychologically getting to the end of their packet. If their period is horrible, either heavy, long or painful, then there's no doubt that if you can address the period, then the knowledge that a period is going to come and the worry about oh my God, I, I'm not going to be able to go to that party or I'm not going to be able to perform well in that exam or what am I, oh, what am I going to wear then? I, oh, I can't possibly wear that. I can't possibly swim. It's going to ruin everything. So if you can, you can deal with the period, you can often deal with the premenstrual aspect. And there are a number of other strategies uh, which um, are, uh, uh, can be tried at that time. So again, don't put up with it. And then an extreme of that uh, is something that has now been given a name, which is the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is, it is 
an extreme, completely debilitating uh, disturbance related to um, ovarian function. Um, and um, if one, if one uh, has a lady who uh, feels that her life is uh, destroyed in the, uh, by, by this repetitive, it comes around with repetitive um, frequency, oh, uh, then there are ways of dealing with it. And my usual strategy is to abolish ovarian function first uh, and see if, first of all, with the pill, it, it, it sorts it out. If it doesn't, then to switch everything off with monthly injections for six months to see if having no hormones for six months will restore her equilibrium. And if it does and she feels a thousand times better, then one may uh, go to adding back hormone replacement therapy at that point, because it's a sequential trial, if you like, a, sequen uh, a sequence of trying to work out is there a strategy that's going to work? And if that works and she still feels well on the HRT component, because some ladies won't feel well on HRT, then the strategy at that point, if her family is complete, is to telescopically remove her ovaries and go on to a no bleed HRT regime. It, these things are very rare, but they are real and women need and deserve uh, help with them. So I do believe that women need to control, be in control. So what is not all right, as opposed to uh, uh, suck it up, it's, it's uh, uh, every woman's the same. Time off school or college is definitely not all right. Being kept awake at night is not all right. Making a mess of your sheets or having to change during the night is not all right. Not going to a party is definitely not all right. Missing sport is not all right. Spoiling a holiday is not all right. And as I've said, I do believe that the gender pay gap starts here. Oh, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing, Karen. I want, yeah, if you could stop sharing your screen, then- I will indeed stop sharing my screen then we can um, get ourselves back up here. Um, wow, that is so comprehensive. You covered so many things. And I did have uh, one or two questions. Um, and I think uh, it would be useful. You've actually, many of them you've, you've covered already. But I think one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, this, this possibly a myth that if you've started your periods early, is it possible that your menopause might come earlier? Well, it, it's sort of not a myth. Uh, it's, it's probably statistically true in as much as it's related to the number of eggs you have. Uh, but it's a bit like people who say to me, my mother started her change at 44. Uh, it, it, probably if you looked at whole populations, there will be an association, but it's not a practical value. Do no. you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. That's Well, I, th I think your description of the... Gaussian, is that the way it right? Gaussian, Gaussian distribution. That's <laughs> so interesting, isn't it? To see the, the, the average and then the extremes at both ends. That was yeah. that's really, really helpful. And, and the other thing I think was, do you think that by understanding the, the role that hormones play during our cycle, that that might make us a little bit more aware of what might be happening as we approach perimenopause? Uh, yes, certainly. Well, uh, if you only took it at its simplest level, um, if you uh, take the sort of immense menstrual irregularity and sometimes peri perimenopausal uh, menstrual chaos that can occur. Um, yes, that's important to understand that because that is because eggs are not being produced rhythmically and therefore there's a lack of rhythm. Um, and when the womb lining is overstimulated by estrogen, not counterbalanced by the progesterone, the womb lining can become thicker uh, and bleeding tends to be heavier and more protracted. And indeed, illness may develop within the womb lining because of overstimulation by estrogen. So it's really important that women in perimenopausal uh, time, that they don't just think, oh, well, that's, it's just because of my, I'm approaching the menopause. On the contrary, they must be alert to having uh, illness of the lining of the womb uh, looked for at that time. 
And would that be, sorry, would that be pain or would that be a period of spotting when you actually, your periods have stopped? And so it posts sort of almost, you, you think your periods have stopped and then you might have some more spotting. Is that a time when you should perhaps seek help and, and look? Yes, yes, I think you should. You definitely should. Yeah. Um, often, it, I mean, the ovaries can give a, a, a final little burst of activity, but you should never accept it as such. And if, I mean, a lot of ladies will come and tell me, um, my period's gone on for three weeks. And I say, no, <laughs> you mean you've been bleeding for three weeks. That's not a period. They, they still call anything that's blood a period. Yeah, well, I think that was really interesting. I think that probably one of the things that I found most interesting was that the period is not just the lining of the womb, that there's the bleeding mm. that comes through the, the, the little tiny arteries in the, in, in the uterus. Yes. Uh, yeah. Karen, I think we're, we're sort of nearly on, on two o'clock. And I think, um, although these webinars can go on longer, I think um, that's been a really, really interesting. And I'm sure you'd I like to just tell us a bit long. about, about yeah. your Dr. Morton's helpline. Would you like to just quickly tell us a tiny bit about oh, that right. and how people yeah, can see it when they need it? Yeah, yeah. So um, my service, Dr. Morton's medical helpline, is, is unique in as much as it, not only do we have extremely experienced GPs, which is great, uh, but in my mind, medicine has got too big for general practice. And I think that women are the, the main losers on that front. Um, and so we uniquely have gynecologists on the, on the phone available. Uh, it's, um, we're um, open from seven in the morning till 11 at night, every day of the week. And our, but our gynees are on in the every evening and all day at the weekends. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's very inexpensive. Um, and um, our system recognizes the caller's phone number and their gender, and they're offered a gynecologist um, if they would like, if they have a woman's health issue. Um, and um, it's been, I, I'm very proud of it really. And now we're also live in a number of general practices uh, where our customer of course is the, is the GP practice and they are offering our gyne, gyne services directly um, to their patients. And my goodness, the take up on that is huge. And um, I'm, I'm going to try and disrupt the model of primary care. I'm in, I'm, I've, I've um, written in response to the government's call for a women's health strategy, uh, because I think that um, our service uh, and a new model for primary care would benefit women uh, hugely. Well, and I'm sure during the pandemic, this has been, has, has it been in great demand? Because it's so much yes, has been on the telephone, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Karen, just one thing to finish with that I meant to talk about was we, you talked a little bit about the fact that your mother didn't tell you anything and I was in a similar situation and you know and I'm just wondering now I think that uh, the national curriculum at, even at primary level does have to talk about menstruation so in theory it could yeah. be a combination between but between the, the, the role of education and schools and parents couldn't, couldn't it be and it, it, it yes seems... yes no of course to be a really definitely important. could definitely yeah could. great yeah. okay yeah, reproductive health brilliant well thank you so much um we're going to make sure that this is available um to be to be uh viewed on the on the yes website and your dr morton's you can find that by searching for drmortons.com is that right yeah yeah absolutely Fantastic. absolutely and if you send me a copy of the webinar i'll put it up as well that would be wonderful i will do thank you so much Talk. Pleasure. Okay. Really nice to see you, Lavinia. And you too. Bye, Take everybody. Care. Bye. Bye-bye.